Okay. Looks like we're live. Uh, welcome to Dive Into World Building. I'm really excited this week because we have with us the fabulous author Ken Liu, who is joining us to talk about his book, which is out today. So timing could not be better, right? <laughs> um, the Grace of Kings, which is getting all kinds of amazing super buzz all over the internet that I have seen in the last few days. I'm really excited for you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, how about we, um, I ask you to start by telling us a little bit about what the book is about for a general orientation for people who don't know. Uh, sure. Um, so The Grace of Kings is an epic fantasy. Um, it is a little bit different um, from a lot of other modern epic fantasies in that um, it's both got a very different aesthetic as well as a different kind of uh, narrative approach. Um, so The Grace of Kings actually is a reimagining uh, of a foundational narrative from Chinese literature. Um, so in the same way that in the West, um, the Iliad, the Odyssey, Beowulf, and these national epics are foundational narratives uh, for national literatures. Um, they're, they're retold, reimagined, and reworked in various ways over time, and all future works are in conversation with these foundational narratives in some way. Uh, and you can say that these works, uh, in a sense, form the, um, the, the base uh, for how a people approaches literature and understands the idea of storytelling. Um, in China, uh, the historical romances serve the same sort of role um, as these national epics in the West. Um, so one of the most well-known uh, Chinese romances, it, historical romances, is Romance of the Three Kingdoms. Um, and most Western um, readers, I think, are exposed to it through video games uh, and other kind of adaptation based on it. But uh, the idea is the same. Um, the Grace of Kings actually is based on even older narrative, uh, 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 foundational narrative. Um, it's about the founding of the Han Dynasty. Um, the the actual story is told um, in real history um, by Sima Qian in uh, records of the Grand Historian, um, which is analogous to uh, Herodotus's histories. Uh, it's sort of the foundation for how Chinese historiography. Uh, is conducted. Um, he is a historian belonging to the Han Dynasty, and he writes about the founding of the dynasty um, in the form of these biographies of important historical figures to that to that story. <clears throat> and so, basically, the Han Dynasty came to be because um, its predecessor, the Qing Dynasty, which is a very very um, tyrannical, short-lived dynasty, uh, caused uh, a series of rebellions. Uh, by the oppressed population, and uh, as the country fell into chaos, um, it broke into numerous kingdoms, and out of which two great powers emerged, uh, Western Chu and Han, uh, and these two powers, led by two very different leaders, um, engaged in a multi-year struggle for dominance, uh, and so this is the basic story uh, that I am reimagining uh, with mm -hmm. Uh, the Grace of Kings. It's a story about two very different men who come together to um, become friends as they join a rebellion against the emperor and as they become um, stronger and more powerful they're, they find that their strength complement each other um, but because their ideologies are so different about how to make the world better mm. they end up having to go into a rivalry. So that's the basic um, story of of, of the Grace of Kings um, in terms of, of plot. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of really interesting world building stuff we can get into. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I read a little bit of the, of the story. Um, I'm, I'm impressed with what I've heard described as, you know, the, the detail and the richness of this world. Um, it's very, very cool. I mean, I, one of the things that, that really exemplified the, the feel of it for me was the idea of the perfumed bubbles. And, and this is like the, the tiniest detail. It, I don't think it necessarily has any grander significance, but um, there's, there's this description of these women standing outside. I believe it was a party um, greeting guests and treating them to these, these perfumed bubbles that they created by first inhaling perfumed smoke and then blowing bubbles with it so they would pop and release fragrances into the faces of the guests. 
That's um, right. That's right. It's just such a what I what I loved about it was it's such a marvelous little detail that has so many broader implications for aesthetics and the world at large and the kinds of things that people value. Um, yeah, I mean, fragrance and that kind of thing is something that, that I have some experience with having read a lot of Japanese uh, literature. And, uh, but it's not something I see a lot in, in Western, uh, uh, Western work. So, yeah, so I thought that was just, anyway, lovely. I'm wondering, with all of the things that you have going on in this world, whether, there, whether you have an entry point, um, you know, uh, some kind of kernel of, of, oh, here's where my idea for this world started. I know that you have these, the reimagining of the foundational narrative, but there, was there a particular quality that you wanted this world to have that differentiates it, say, from the, the original narratives about ancient China? Well, uh, uh, yes, uh, is the brief answer. The the full answer is is a, is a lot more complicated. So, um, when I wanted to set out to do the story, one of the first decisions I made is that I wasn't going to write a magical China story because um, I think um, magical China stories, especially in epic fantasy, are very problematic. Um, there's a very long and troubled history um, in the West encounter with China dating back to the days of Marco Polo, where um, the the insistence on Western subjectivity um, causes repeated misinterpretations and layers of misunderstandings of what China actually is. Um, there's a lot of wish fulfillment in the way these Western narratives about China are, are written. Um, and and it's, it's to the point where the Orientalism and the colonial gaze are no longer um, separable, really, uh, from the very basic terms we use to describe classical China. So, for example, it's, it's very problematic to translate the Chinese mythological creature um, uh, as, a, as a Chinese dragon, quote-unquote. Um, that's, that's, that um, essentially treats the Chinese mythological creature as a derivative or a variety of the Western creature, when in fact the two of them have nothing to do with each other at all. The, the creature known as a Chinese dragon is not a dragon. It has nothing to do with the element of fire. It has nothing to do with demonic associations, the devil. Um, right. Creature of water, um, it's generally benevolent, and it is in fact um, derived both from classical, very, very ancient Chinese tribal um, um, totems as well as Buddhist Naga um, deities. So by translating them as Chinese dragons, um, we're, we're already uh, forcing them in, into a framework, of a, a semantic framework from which they cannot be extracted. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it is it's basically impossible um, uh, to view a lot of these classical Chinese elements with fresh eyes. Um, the, the, the miasma of this Orientalism and, and the colonial gaze is just so heavy um, that I, I, I think if I tried to reimagine the story in such a setting, it would have been impossible. Also, I think that kind of uh, story, while it has its place, uh, is not the kind of story I wanted to write. I wanted to write a story about um, transformation, change. Um, you know, a lot of epic fantasy narratives, I think, try to go for the return to the status quo ante kind of narrative arc. So you start out with um, chaos, and the point is to restore things to some golden age. Uh, you know, in the way that uh, Lord of the Rings really is about that. Um, it's 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 there and back again. It's about return of the king. It's it's this idea of return to a golden status quo ante, and that is not the kind of story I wanted to write. So I I disliked the idea of of creating a setting um, that drew too much from that problematic aspect of Orientalism. So what I wanted to do is to create a new world uh, that's clearly East Asia inspired and yet extremely distinct from it. Uh, I wanted to um, estrange reader expectations so that readers can approach this world and the story with fresh eyes. Um, if they come in saying, you know, this is alternative China, this is magical China, then the story will read very differently to them than if they come in they're like, wow, this is very different, I don't know what this is. Uh, and, and that's the latter that I wanted. Um, so <clears throat> with that kernel in mind, I ended up creating a world that's as far from continental China as possible. Um, you know, instead of being a, 
a unified large continental state, um, Dara, the magical land uh, in my novel, is a set of islands. It's an archipelago. Um, and I wanted to create a distinct um, technology vocabulary for it. Uh, I wanted to write a story that um, falls into the aesthetic that I describe as silk punk. Um, so silk punk, um, the punk part is easy to explain. Um, I think a lot of times people use the punk suffix just to mean, you know, it's it's got something to do with steam or, or diesel or biotechnology or something. I, I actually tried to treat the punk part a little bit more seriously. I, I wanted to go back to the idea that punk is about rebellion. It's about challenging existing attitudes. It's about trying to create a revolution. Um, so that part of the of, of, of the aesthetic is, is definitely based on the idea of continuous rebellion, continuous revolution. Um, the silk part is a little, requires a little more explanation. So I'm very much influenced by uh, W. Brian Arthur's uh, theories of technology. He's a, he's a prominent economist who has done a lot of thinking into technology, what it is and how it works. Um, and one of the insights I gained from his work is this notion of, 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 of treating technology not as individual pieces of machinery that you, you invent, but rather as components of a much larger um, aesthetic or language of expression. So engineers, uh, in this view, are very creative artists. What they do when engineers are, are, are told to design something, what they're doing really is to create a new utterance or a new expression in an existing language of technology. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the individual words of this technology are sub-assemblies or components. Uh, so things like transistors, batteries, um, uh, switches, hard disks, things like that. And then there are uh, grammars and known idioms that engineers have worked out over time to be pleasing or effective in achieving a certain goal. Mm -hmm. And as an engineer, what your job is is to harmonize and assemble all these components together the way a writer puts together words and idioms and, 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 and phrases into a pleasing sentence, paragraph, and then eventually a story. An engineer does the same thing. It's a hierarchical building up of subcomponents into sub-assemblies, mm -hmm. into assemblies, into components, and then into this coherent whole. Um, and the idea is that because it's a language, it evolves, it changes, and there's a distinctness to the way um, each technology domain's language is different. Um, the language of electronic design is different from the way STEAM uh, dominated Victorian era technology is. So, you know, w once you've sort of viewed technology this way, you realize that all these different um, dash punk kind of, of, of subgenres are really. Um, about creating different technology aesthetics, different technology languages. So mm -hmm. I wanted to create a very distinct one for my world. And what I ended up doing is I decided that the vocabulary, the, the nouns of this, this technology language would be organic materials uh, of historical importance to East Asia and to seafaring cultures of the Pacific. So things like bamboo, paper, silk, uh, these are very important to, to East Asia. Um, and then things like corals, fish scales, shell, coconut, things that are important to a seafaring culture of the Pacific. I combine these. These are the foundational nouns of the technology language. And then I said, you know, the verbs of the language, the power sources, are going to be wind, water, oxen, um, uh, muscle. Um, and then the grammar and the expression, uh, the, the rules uh, of this language would be based on biomechanics. Um, so I combine all of these together to create a very distinctive uh, technology look. Um, so if you think about steampunk, it's a very Victorian era derived kind of technology aesthetic. Um, right. There's a harmony between the way the, the technology language is, 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 is used and the way the moral attitudes are expressed. So there's a very gleaming brass, glass kind of hard look to steampunk technology. And at the same time, um, there's this idea of, of constriction, of, 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 of umpire, uh, sort of uh, expressed by the corseted body. There's, there's a lot of this very constricted, proper um, uh, guiding and, 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 and sort of uh, taming nature. Um, silk punk, by analogy, is, 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 is a little bit different in that the overall aesthetic is one of, of, of trying to go with nature and trying to imitate nature and trying to create um, flexible um, 
more, uh, for lack of a better word, more lively kind of technology. So, for example, the airships um, in in my book, um, they regulate their buoyancy using these giant gas bags that are constructed, constricted, uh, and then expanded um, to change the amount of lift that they generate. Uh, this is similar to the way swim bladders in fish work, but it's actually very different from the way um, zeppelins uh, in our world worked. Um, by the same token, these airships are propelled by these giant feathered oars, um, not by a propeller. Um, and so when one of these airships is sort of working through the air, um, it's being, you know, the frame is constructed from silk and bamboo, it, it has this very flexible breathing kind of quality to it. Um, when it's lit up at night, one of these airships sort of pulsates um, like a jellyfish um, as it sort of swims very slowly through a starry sky. And, and that's kind of the aesthetic I wanted to carry through for everything. Um, the, the artificial limbs I create for um, soldiers in the novel uh, are based on <clears throat> classical uh, Chinese mechanical engineering with ox sinew uh, doing a lot of the, the, the balancing. Um, and uh, there are, you know, giant battle kites, uh, which are, again, taken from uh, classical Chinese and Korean predecessors. Um, a lot of the, there are also hot air balloons, which are also, again, based on classical Chinese inventions. So a lot of these inventions look like they could have been derived from East Asia origins, and yet they're very distinct. Uh, not only is it, you know, much more advanced and blown up, but it also incorporates this very... Um, explicitly lifelike kind of kind of feel. So um, if you've seen a lot of uh, Chinese block prints and Japanese block prints, um, you, you'll see that there's there's that sense of, 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 of technology being um, uh, a, a, a very, not, 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 not something that is set apart from daily life, but rather a very integral part of life and a very um, approachable, uh, lifelike uh, aspect of, of, of our lives. Um, and so that's the that's the silk punk uh, aesthetic that I wanted to, to do and it guided sort of the world building. Um, it, you know, this being a fantasy, of course, I had to add a lot of magical elements as well. But the magical elements I added were also uh, done in a way to 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 deepen and to add to the to the overall silk punk aesthetic. Um, so um, anyway, I, I I think that. Uh, probably sort of gives you a little bit of an insight into how I went about it. I, I, I had an idea, a particular look I mm -hmm. wanted to achieve with principles, and then I designed things around that to achieve it. Yeah, so how long have you been working, how, how long were you working on this before you were able to get it to a point where it turned into a narrative? Um, it This thing, it's very hard to say. I mean, this novel has been rewritten so many times, I, I really can't even tell you how many drafts there are, and, and, and the drafts are very different from each other. I mean, I think the very first draft I wrote, um, I, I don't think was um, more than 100,000 words or so. Um, and then um, it, it was very spare and had a very sort of unformed aesthetic. Um, it, it took time to figure out how the world, how I wanted the world to be, um, how I wanted the culture, different cultures to be differentiated from each other and how I wanted the languages to be to be placed. Um, so it took a long time and I don't, I can't remember exactly which draft and how long it took me to get to the point where I thought I actually had something. I mean, um, one of the things that's kind of interesting about having this discussion is, I think a lot of times writers don't acknowledge this, but a lot of times the stories we tell about our own processes are, are too good to be true. Um, in that the the actual process of creation is very messy and not so guided, but when we're sort of asked later on at the end, we sort of look back and retroactively construct a nice narrative about how we went about doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think a little bit of that is happening here. Um, what I'm telling you now is a much more organized, coherent narrative about what happened. Uh, yeah. The reality was likely far more messy. It, it was probably a lot of experimentation, a lot of poking around, a lot of this is not working, let's try this, before I eventually got the idea that I'm describing to you now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and I think also a lot of what what we figure out as authors ends up being things that come from our subconscious and, and that, you know, little knots that tie each other while we sleep. <laughs> yes. And all that kind of thing. So it, it's, it's, um, 
interesting to put it into a narrative, but I see that there are lots of things that narratives can't capture in that way. Um, so, okay. Um, oh, shoot. I lost the thought that I just had. <laughs> <laughs> that happens to me all the time as I'm exhausted. <laughs> oh, yes, actually. There we are. <laughs> I found it. Um, so I was wondering about um, your research process. Did, um, how much of this is, you know, things that you just sort of had in your head that you wanted to um, bring out into a more sort of, I don't know, detailed narrative form? And how much of it was stuff where you actually said, well, I've got to go look things up and figure this out and, and that kind of thing? Well, I, guess, um, I guess what research did you do as you were working on this? Right. Um, I, I say it's probably half and half, actually, in terms of what I already had in my head versus new things I had to learn. Um, I mean, you know, the idea of telling, retelling this foundational narrative um, is, is very old. And the inspiration for it is because, you know, when I was a little kid in China, mm -hmm. uh, I'd, I'd run home every day from uh, grade school uh, so I can join my grandmother and listen to the storytellers on the radio. Uh, that was how I um, was exposed to Romance of the Three Kingdoms uh, in the first mm -hmm. place. Um, you know, uh, there was a really famous storyteller on the radio who spent an hour every day during lunch to tell episodes from the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, and I was just utterly entranced with my grandmother. Um, uh, it's, it's a very sweet memory from, from my childhood, uh, the two of us sort of sitting there listening to the radio uh, and just, uh, and then discussing the story afterwards. and. Uh, uh, you know, I would get all uh, upset when some hero was betrayed, and and, and get all excited. Um, you know, when a strategy, uh, a stratagem is 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 working. Uh, you know, I, had, I have such vivid memories of that time. Uh, uh, it was really a great, great thing that gra my grandma, uh, grandmother, and I did, uh, which is why the book is dedicated to her. Um, oh, so, great. so. Um, the, 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 the idea of these foundational narratives, uh, you know, were very deep in my head. So I always had um, echoes and snippets of these stories in me. Um, but to, to really actually try to reimagine the, the narrative in a coherent way, I, I, I had to go back and read the source material. Um, I ended up reading uh, Records of the Grand Historian, um, uh, this classical Chinese text, which was, you know, not easy for me. Um, uh, I never academically, formally studied classical Chinese, a lot of it had involved self-learning and, and sort of teaching myself how to, how to do it. Uh, um, and as I was saying, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the novel involved very detailed uh, engineering, essentially fictional engineering, but nonetheless engineering. So um, I ended up having to do quite a bit of uh, research into um, the way airships worked. Uh, I looked up old patents. Um, uh, I, I ended up researching how early steam engines worked. Um, how you know uh, herbal lore worked? Uh, almost everything in there that uh, has the appearance of being technical uh, probably does have some actual bits of technical knowledge behind it. Uh, I took that pretty seriously. Um, of course, I um, ended up you know doing a lot of the the, the kind of uh, science kind of research into that into that area. Um, but the other area of research that I did that I think maybe a little bit unusual is I also want, wanted to. Um, try to tell the story in a, in a new narrative approach. So <clears throat> mm -hmm. a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of uh, um, uh, because this is a foundational narrative from a different culture, one of the things that I think um, readers will find interesting is that the structure of the book is, is, is very unusual. Uh, and the, the, the way uh, point of view and other um, uh, narrative conventions are used is different from modern Western contemporary uh, uh, contemporary Western epic fantasy. Um, yeah. it, it, in a lot of ways, I think the story feels like it's being told in an older form that harks back to the oral traditions more. Um, what I'm really doing here is, is evoking um, a lot of the conventions that are used in Chinese historical romances and in oral storytelling, uh, as well as in wuxia fantasies. Um, and then what I've done here is I've melded them with a lot of uh, tropes and techniques taken from old Western epics that I really love. Um, so the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Aeneid, uh, Paradise Lost, Beowulf, um, you know, these are works I love. And so I took little techniques and bits and pieces from, from all of these that I love and I put them together with uh, narrative approaches I wanted to take from 
the Chinese tradition, and I sort of combined them into this one um, melded whole. Um, it, it's, it's an interesting effect. I think um, if, if you're not familiar with what I'm doing and you just go into it cold, it will take you a little bit of time before you get used to it because uh, it, it's just it, it feels it feels a little strange at first uh, because I'm not doing the thing of, of contemporary epic fantasy where you're very tightly focused on one point of view and then you shift between different characters uh, and everything is seen from up close. Um, there are entire sections where I just pull back uh, and use this omniscient epic voice, uh, a technique that's very rarely seen these days in contemporary epic fantasy, uh, or really in epic, uh, in, in, in uh, modern uh, contemporary liter uh, Western literature at all. Um, I think a lot of readers, beta readers, told me that it reminded them of War and Peace, uh, and, and I, I, I agree with that. Uh, that. That is kind of the feel I wanted to go for. It's, 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 it's this very big sweep um, kind of storytelling. A lot of the older epics have that kind of approach. To, 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 to pull back in a very distant way, uh, just just lay out the scene, tell you the story of grand nations and, and empires, and then you zoom in all of a sudden, uh, and now you're looking um, through the through the world uh, at the world through the eyes of, of a single young woman, uh, and, and then then it becomes her story, and then the the story pulls back again. There's a lot of this pulling back, zooming in, pulling back, zooming in kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, which is very different from how a lot of other epic fantasies structure their, 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 their narrative all around the idea of very tight focus uh, uh, point of view uh, and just switching back and forth. This one can be a little bit um, uh, strange to a reader, but I think, I think after you've gone through this a couple of times, you'll, you'll figure out what I'm doing, and then uh, I think you'll, you'll get... Uh, used to it. I think the, the the approach is meant to to allow you to feel that this is something new, but also really old and mythic at the same time. That was the effect. Sorry, I'm I'm writing down my notes so that I can write a good report later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about the flower metaphors. Oh yeah. Um, so uh, I, I will tell you here, but you can also go on to uh, Mary Robinette Koal's site uh, later. I have an essay on there um, in her My Favorite Bit um, uh, feature uh, in which I talk about the flower metaphors. So uh, the, the novel was originally titled uh, The Chrysanthemum and the Dandelion. Uh, that was the original title. Um, and I think it was a good thing that we changed it because that would have been uh, a different kind of feel, and I think might have not clued readers in to the fact that it's an epic fantasy. Um, but, but structurally, that's how I conceive of the novel. The novel is about two very different leaders um, and their leadership styles, and the two flowers, the chrysanthemum and the dandelion, sort of symbolizes these two approaches. One of them is very noble, austere, um, very dominant, uh, for lack of a better word. It's, it's this idea of, of, of honor, bravery, courage uh, and, and trusting uh, that you, you're doing the right thing, having no doubts. That, that's the idea. Um, the other approach with the dandelion is much more about being practical. Um, the idea that, you know, um, we're, we're, we're really, you know, just kind of a weed. Uh, and what our beauty is about roadside um, uh, practicality and, and the idea of being survivors, uh, being uh, being uh, resourceful um, and, and being resilient. Um, and so these two approaches are very different and they lead to different ideas about how to create a world that's more just. And I carry the, the flower metaphor throughout. There's a scene in which many of the, the major characters in the novel, it's one of my favorite scenes, um, get together to play a drinking game. And the game is that uh, each of them will compare themselves to a different flower. Um, and if the, flower, if the comparison is apt, um, everybody else will drink, uh, but if 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 all the uh, other uh, players think that the comparison is terrible, then the person has to drink. Um, and so, so you you uh, the scene involves playing this game, and it's it's a way to uh, for me to do characterization and and to reveal to readers a little more about um, the the characters uh, and 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 their personalities and and their foibles and their their strength. Um, and I, I love the, 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 the fact that the flower um, metaphor is so flexible. You can do a lot of 
really interesting things with it uh, and make flowers appear um, so that you know once you build up this language of metaphors later on you can you can evoke entire emotions uh, by describing a single flower um, and this of course actually is is, is based on a historical uh, analog um, there is a, a famous rebellion that started uh, because uh, the leader composed a poem praising the chrysanthemum um, when the official flower um, uh, was, was not the chrysanthemum. So praising the chrysanthemum in the, in the, in the poem in the imperial capital um, when done in certain contexts was, was a political act. Uh, and so the association of flowers with politics uh, is something very resonant to that Chinese literary tradition. Uh, and so I took that and I wanted to uh, play with it and do something very uh, interesting and hopefully you know readers enjoy that. Yeah. I think yeah, and I think I think that's really fascinating that 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 you have this connection between flowers and politics and flowers and personalities and and it, it creates this really neat just sort of sense of connection between a lot of different levels uh, in the narrative. Yeah. So thank you for thank you for explaining that. Um Okay, so let's see. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm going to ask you about one other thing, and then I'm going to give some other people a chance to come up with some questions. I wanted to ask you about the birds that you used in the story. The birds? Yeah. Because there are a lot um, of birds. At least at the beginning, there are a lot of mentions of birds. Yeah. Um, so one of the things um, that's interesting about this world is that... Um, so so this, is, this is kind of interesting. Um, because I set the world in an archipelago, um, uh, it, it actually really subtly changed a lot of things about the world, and it's it's very challenging to figure out how to make it work. Um, because it's an island world, um, getting from island to island is very important, both for trade and for politics and for military maneuvers and and so on and so forth. So, a lot of energy had to put into um, inventing. Um, ships and airships uh, or other vehicles of, of getting between the islands uh, and so uh, this this actually ended up infecting even the sort of metaphors that people would use um, you know I, I became conscious of the fact that as I was writing the novel um, it, it became more and more common for characters to use sea related and, 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 and sky related imagery and that made sense uh, and so I had to go back and, and rewrite the earlier parts of the novel to fit that but it's interesting to sort of see how um, how if you really build the world well and you really live in it you, you sort of start to think like your characters and you sort of understand that if they're you know their daily lives revolve around the sea uh, then of course their metaphors and, and the kind of images that they will pull into their speech would be very much sea driven um, the, the, the bird is uh, the bird thing is is because um, the the invention uh, and the maintenance of air power uh, is very important in this world. Um, I actually wrote a prequel to the novel in the form of a novelette that was published in Lightspeed uh, a while ago. It's called None Knows the Air. And it's set about 40, 50 years before the events of the first novel. But basically, uh, it describes how the, the various kingdoms uh, of, of, of Dara, the, the archipelago, are locked in this stalemate where none of the kingdoms are strong enough to, to really conquer the, uh, any of the others because uh, they've reached a stalemate of naval and, and, uh, and, and land-based forces. Um, and so one of the things that, that, that um, uh, they had to come up with is, is how, do you, how do you change this balance of power? How do you, how do you disrupt it? Um, and one of the weaker states in the Northwest um, was not doing so well in, in the balance of power in terms of, uh, of its navy and its army. So uh, the king invented, uh, invested a lot into, into, into disruptive technologies. You know, when, you, when you're locked into this balance of power um, military-wise where you're, you're not able to overcome your foes in conventional means, you have to figure out a way to disrupt it. Uh, and, you know, one of the classical ways that, that happens in history is by inventing a new method of warfare. And so, in this world, they ended up inventing uh, airships uh, uh, and, and air, aerial warfare to, to change the balance of power. Um, and there was a lot of um, discussion in the book about 
how the engineers come up with this idea by 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 observing birds uh, and and trying to do scientific analysis of how they fly. Um, this is another thing about the novel I think that's kind of interesting, which is that it's epic fantasy, but um, when the original short story I wrote was published, I think one of the critics um, who read it, uh, her uh, analysis of it was, I'm not sure why this is called fantasy because it reads like science fiction to me. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm happy with that because that, that is kind of the approach I like. Uh, I am a technologist and I like to do um, things um, that way. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a geek. I, I like these uh, mechanical engineering type of stuff. So. Um, so, so the 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 fact that there are so many birds there is related to the fact that I had a lot of uh, a lot of things related to observations of of, of flight and how birds um, f uh, uh, migrate between islands and how, how how birds have these different qualities that are very interesting and how engineers pay attention to them, which is why they they devise new ways to improve the air power uh, of their vehicles. Um, so that's that's how that came about because people are really interested in flight, and so there's a lot of observation of birds, and, and they end up taking prominent part in the narrative. Very cool. So, um, so I wanted to. I have okay. So I have one more question. <laughs> okay. And it may be a whole other thing, but so this is this is. Uh, I wanted to ask you something about. Um, uh, how you approached your uh, let's see how you approach the gender of your characters because uh, this is not a part of the book that I have read yet I will say that but I have noted a few people who are who have been reviewing the book who said oh well you know at the beginning I wasn't sure because there seemed to be very few women around and then there was this big change that occurred in the book and so anyway I wanted to see if you could reflect a little bit on on that aspect of, of the story yeah, so so this is what I was trying to do. So one of the things that happens when you're trying to reimagine um, a, a historical romance like this or, or a historical epic like this is that um, it, it's very easy to become trapped uh, by the source material. Um, mm -hmm. You will no doubt have noticed that if you read, um, you know, Beowulf um, or, or the Aeneid uh, or the Iliad, um, th these, these are worlds in which um, it is predominantly the men who do the fighting, uh, and because these are epics of warfare, um, it, it becomes a sausage fest. Uh, there, 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 there are very few women characters, and especially very few women characters who um, have much agency. Um, and so if you want to reimagine one of these stories in a different setting, and you just sort of go straight with the source material, it's very easy to fall into the trap of just replicating that in your, in your book. Um, and if your explanation for that is, well, I'm just reimagining, you know, history. That's the way it was. Um, that, that, that's kind of a cop out because, yeah. uh, first of all, everybody knows that that that's in fact not um, quote unquote historically accurate for whatever that means because um, you know fully half the human race are women, uh, either in the time of Homer or now. So um, it's not that there were no women. It's simply that they were not recorded in the particular right. epic you were reading. So if you're going to reimagine it it's not really much of an excuse to say that you forgot about them. Um, and, and, if you, and if your explanation is, well, you know, I was trying to be, trying to be faithful to the source, well, you know, again, if I'm going to add airships to the story, then yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a little preposterous to argue that that's the reason. So that's, that's not the reason. That's not the reason. Um, I went out consciously to, to write a story which will try to um, highlight these particular um, aspects of an epic narrative and then try to question it um, because the, the the gender issue you know is, is much better now because a lot of you know excellent work by writers like Kate Elliott and Cameron Hurley uh, have really changed the way we sort of view um, gender uh, uh, representation in epic fantasy but there is, is this historical problem with epic fantasy and the way they, they, they treat women um, and at the same time, the historical romances like Romance of the Three Kingdoms that I draw inspiration from have a similar kind of problem with the representation of women. So one of the things I want to do is to, um, is to reimagine the story, but also at the same time question and critique the source uh, by, by trying to do uh, something different. Um, and so the way I want to do this is by starting the story in a place where it reads sort of like a historical uh, epic fantasy. I mean epic. Epic, uh, where it's 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 the men who do the fighting, 
um, uh, it, it's the men who do the politics, and and we only get a few glimpses of women here and there. I mean, I, I drop some hints. I mean, there are scenes in which the lives of the women are are, are revealed, uh, but they don't take center stage. And so, you know, I, I don't want to give everything away, but the point is that because this is a novel about change, it's a novel about rebellion, about challenging the status quo. Um, part of the narrative arc has to be this long arc about what is a more ideal world. Um, when you're in a weak position um, as a military leader, where do you get more power? Where do you draw your strength? Do you try to rely on those who already have a lot of power, or do you try to rely on people who don't have a lot of power? You know, that's sort of the question that faces these leaders. And again, I, I'm, I don't want to give it away, but the, the, the change that these, these reviewers are referring to is, is this idea of maybe there's another way to get power. Uh, and, and that is kind of the narrative arc of the first book. Um, but even at the end of the first book, um, I, I think it's important for people to know that this is not um, utopia. This is not like a perfect world. Um, the, the women characters question their confined roles and, and, and things change, but they, they, they are still not perfect um, because what I'm writing here is a long, long arc. There's an arc that goes over multiple books. Uh, and it's a book. Of, it's it's a series about continuous revolution and continuous change. So mm -hmm. um, the idea would be something like you know Doom. You know, at the end of Doom, um, we reach a certain point. A lot of plot lines are resolved, but you know we have not reached utopia. And so then you have Children of Doom, uh, and, and so that's sort of the approach I'm going with. Here. Cool. Well, so much the better. I hope you get to write all all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm going to open it up to questions from the people who are still with us. Well, one thing, I, I guess this is not directly about your book, but earlier you, you talked about the concept of Chinese dragons and not be that not being what as being totally unrelated to Western dragons. Uh, uh, it, would there be, is there a better word than dragon? That right. Might so, work or? Yeah, so, so here, this is, this is the question that um, when you're talking about translation, you're always faced with. Um, so a lot of people think of, of, of translation as a, as a mere linguistic uh, act, uh, but it's actually not. Um, um, you know, we live in this day and age where um, it seems like Google Translate can do the translation automatically and there's no creat creativity involved. But, but in fact, the way we got to this point is because there have been generations of, of explorers and, 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 and sort of pioneers who try to negotiate between cultures. Um, you know, when these Western missionaries and traders came to China first, they, they had no word to describe this thing that they saw. This, 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 this new creature they saw, um, they didn't know what it was called. Now, they had two choices. One is to simply take the Chinese word and import it back into Western languages. And the Chinese word for the creature is long, so you can easily imagine um, a, 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 an alternative version of, of, of the evolution of the English language where um, Westerners simply adapted the Chinese word and said, this is a long, uh, and this is our dragon. The two have nothing to do with each other because that's called a long and that's called a dragon. Mm -hmm. um, two different things. If we're talking about China, we'll talk about long, and if we're talking about the West, we'll talk about dragon. And there will be no confusion because uh, the two words are distinct and they have nothing to do with each other. Um, that is not the, the, the version of, the, of, of history that we have. What happened is people said um, the other approach to translation is to instead of taking a word that represents a concept that does not exist in the target language. Um, instead, try to describe that foreign concept using some combination of concepts that already exist in the target culture. And so that's what happened with Dragon. They, they, they went ahead and said, this thing looks like a, a dragon in some way. It's, 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 it's reptilian, uh, seems. I mean, it's like a, it's a scaled serpent. So, you know, reptilian. Um, it's, it's kind of... Uh, big and, and people seem to worship it and think it's awesome and powerful. Uh, that seems a little bit like dragon, I guess. Um, so they went with that. Um, 
the that 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 sort of thing actually happens a lot. I mean, another concept that's very common in translations of Chinese uh, works is is the concept of uh, filial piety, uh, which again is a very problematic translation. Uh, filial piety, uh, I think, often evokes this very supernatural religious awe um, sense um, because of the way we treat the word piety. Um, I have to be very, very cautious about this because I think I think it's 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 it's, it's easy to say uh, to say this in, in accurately. But I would say most scholars of religion would would say that traditional Chinese religions like Buddhism and Taoism um, and sort of folk folk beliefs and, and even Confucianism are very very different from Western religions in terms of, of the concept of piety. Um, uh, the, the, the concept that Westerners translate as filial piety in, in, in Chinese is just called xiaoshun, uh, which has none of this religious sort of um, uh, uh, supernatural awe, religious overtone to it. Um, it I, I can't remember the exact history of, of, of the phrase, but I think it happened during a period of, of Confu Confucianism when it, when it was sort of dominated by Neo-Confucianism, where Ancestor worship was elevated to this quasi-religious kind of role, um, but but still not at the level of, of of what we think of as you know worshiping God. It's it's not like that. Um, but the the idea of translating this concept of reverence for ancestors as as filial piety leads to all kinds of errors uh, of of construction. Um, you know, later on during 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 the the, the colonial era, a lot of uh, a very common trope in Western rhetoric about China is that they worship their ancestors. They uh, they don't they don't believe in God. They believe in the all powerful ancestor. That that is not actually what the Chinese believe. Reverence for your ancestors is not this this concept of 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 um, praying to some supernatural deity. That they're completely not even remotely similar. Um, so by by translating the the the, the, the concept as filial piety is very misleading. Um, but that sort of thing happens a lot. There, there's, there's tons of this kind of slippages where um, words being used to describe a foreign concept are not the words that should have been used, but they were used and they're accepted as convention, and then they lead to layers and layers of misunderstanding. Um, so, and also, you know, there, there, there are tons of other words, concepts. I mean, the, the, the mandate of heaven is another one that often gets invoked. In, 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 in when um, supposed that even experts about China uh, in the West talk about China, uh, again, you know, often very misleading. That that is actually not how the Chinese understand the concept. Often translated as mandate of heaven. Um, anyway, I, I can go on like this forever. But the point is that I <laughs> I didn't want to do anything that invoked those concepts in some way. I I, I found that would have been way too constricting and difficult to create a world that's interesting and lively and fresh. Well, and I think one of the other things that goes on is that once you've once you've invoked a particular uh, schema or structure in a reader's mind, it's very very difficult then to tell somebody to put it away. Right. And what you do, and what you do after that gets reinterpreted within that schema, and so people can feel betrayed by whatever it is that you choose to do afterwards and so just avoiding the whole schema entirely or or um, blocking off all reference to it on an, at an earlier point is actually a much more effective approach on the right, you know, right exactly. in a longer narrative. Yeah. Right, exactly. I mean it, 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 it it's actually um, it's it's actually really difficult to do that. I mean I had I had to struggle so much because if, if I weren't careful, if I just imported one piece of some sort of magical China into the narrative, it, it, I, I'm, I'm risking getting the whole thing pulled in. Uh, I have to be super careful. Uh, I mean, you know, if I started talking about, um, uh, you know, something that looks like Buddhism, if, if, if once readers start saying, oh, this is his fantasy version of Buddhism, you know, I'm doomed. Because once that starts happening, they're going to start reinterpreting and associating everything else into mm -hmm. that format. This is sort of like the the problem when you're doing fantasy world building and you're just sort of borrowing bits and pieces from real cultures and you're not careful, you end up pulling everything else in. Uh, not only are you doing an appropriation, but you're also uh, just prejudicing your readers into misinterpreting and overinterpreting what you're doing there. So right. it, it was a real struggle. I, I had a real hard time getting this right. And I don't know if I got it totally right, but I still think like 
what I ended up doing is sufficiently detached from the source material and yet still pays homage to it that people will be able to see it with a fresh pair of eyes. That that was, you know, that that's the hope. And, and so far it seems like many readers did get what I was yeah, doing. Yeah, I, I think I'm that really I'm happy. seeing people uh, feeling like they really uh, grasped what you were trying to do. So, so fantastic. Any more, any more questions? We're getting to the end of our hour here. <laughs> Oh, that went by very quickly. Yeah. No, see, it just <laughs> zooms right by when you're having fun. <laughs> um, okay, well, so I guess we can we can draw to a close if and nobody else has a particular comment. Ken, thank you so much for being with us. This has been fascinating. I really can't wait to read the rest of the book. Um, I I hope it brings you all kinds of of uh, success and that people will be able to see your vision and uh, be inspired. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, being here. Thank you very much. All right. I'll stop the broadcast. Um, we'll see you next week. <laughs>